couple of weeks ago, it hit 50 degrees, which in Massachusetts is pretty much tropical for this time of year. I decided to take advantage of the good weather and spend the day raking away the thick layer of dead leaves that the previous owners of our house had left covering the yard. It took pretty much all day, but as we slowly moved away the decaying muck, we found a whole world of budding green new life underneath. For six long months, the buds and bulbs and seeds had waited patiently, and now they were finally pushing and elbowing their way up through the dirt. By the time we were done, it looked like spring had come overnight. Luckily, it was just in time, because a couple of days later, a tiny bunch of miniature daffodils burst into bloom. In the summertime, we probably wouldn't have even noticed these tiny little flowers, but in the springtime in the cold north, the appearance of the first flowers is nothing short of miraculous. I think this sense of gratitude and awe at the smallest signs of new life is the reason that so many religions and cultures celebrate rebirth and resurrection during this time of year. I think it's also the reason we celebrate Earth Day every April. Every year on Earth Day, we, we try to work and bring new life, new miracles to an earth that has waited patiently through long years and decades and centuries of human abuse and degradation. This year, I need the hope of Earth Day more than ever. The recently released Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report paints a pretty grim picture of our future. They say that we need to immediately stop using fossil fuels in order to avoid catastrophe. The statistics are so grim that even ExxonMobil, who usually tries to put up a fight, this time said, look, we know it's bad, but we're just gonna keep making fossil fuels anyway. All the doom and gloom that's being reported in the media, in some ways it's a good thing because it means that people are starting to pay attention, that they're starting to take this serious, this issue seriously. But it can also leave people, myself included, feeling overwhelmed or impotent or just shut down and become numb. And these understandable reactions can paralyze us from taking the action that we need to take. In his 2008 documentary, filmmaker Velcro Ripper decides to interview spiritual activists to find out how they use their spirituality to sustain them in the face of their enormous challenges. He interviews everyone from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who worked to fight apartheid in South Africa, to Thich Nhat Hanh, a monk who works for peace in Vietnam. From Congressman John Lewis, who worked with Martin Luther King during the Civil Rights Movement, to Leela Kumari, an activist who works for the rights of the Dalits, or untouchables, in India. Each one of these activists, and so many more that he features, draw on their deep commitment to love and nonviolence. And they use their spiritual practices and religious beliefs to keep them going, to help them prevent burnout and brokenness. Perhaps the most moving part of the film was a quote from Paul Hawken. He's describing that all of these movements for equality and for the environment are like a movement of movements, a slowly emerging force that he believes is humanity's immune response to a planet in crisis. Considering the increasing scientific evidence that our life is an interdependent web of existence and that perhaps our Earth is really like a large single organism, Maybe this idea of an immune system isn't that far-fetched. Since the film was released, the emergence of the Occupy movement, Arab Spring, and European Summer may help to support his theory. Velcro Ripper once asked the famous journalist Naomi Klein, how could the crisis we are facing on the planet become a love story? Her response was a cynical laugh. But two years later, she reportedly came up to him at an event and gave him a huge hug and said, history has rearranged itself to prove your thesis. Her conversion may be the reason she started to work on a book called People's Shock. It came out of her coverage of Hurricane Sandy because she began to see that 
the communities there are organizing to create a more just and sustainable recovery as they've made the link between their natural disaster and climate change. She began to investigate the possibility that climate change may be a force for good all over the world, an opportunity for us to create a more just and sustainable world. And her investigation so far has left her feeling optimistic rather than cynical. I draw enormous hope from all of this. It reminds me of one of my favorite poems by Wendell Berry. The name of the poem is Manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front. But it's a poem that's often used at this time of year because of its famous last line, Practice Resurrection. It was written nearly 40 years ago, and yet it speaks perfectly to this idea that we have to turn away from the status quo, from the way we've always done things, and imagine a better world. There are two lines in particular that speak to me. The first one is, so friends, every day do something that won't compute. Do something that won't compute. Sometimes, what the larger culture tells us is a sensible formula. It doesn't actually add up. We have to be willing to challenge, to risk, to hope, and to even look foolish. The second line in the poem that I cling to is, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. This reminds me again and again that we must hold tightly to the beauty of the world around us, even as we clearly see its ugliness. It reminds me that I have to keep pouring love into my heart so there's no room left for cynicism. In this season of rebirth and resurrection, my heart is full to bursting. I truly believe that humanity is beginning the long, slow process of moving away the muck and finding the budding green life that was underneath all along. Maybe it will even be in time to see a tiny miracle bloom.